Meanwhile, Mali's military coup leaders have met with the general secretaries of the unseated ministries to discuss ways of getting the government working. President Ibrahim Boubacar Kitai resigned and dissolved parliament on Tuesday after mutinous detained him at gunpoint, further rocking a country that is in the grip of a jihadist insurgency and civil unrest. Now, fearing Kita's fall after nearly seven years in power could destabilize the Sahel region, the African Union and Economic Community of West African State ECOWAS both suspended Mali. As investors ditched shares in Mali-based gold mining companies, the mood in the capital Bamako was calm throughout the day, and junta leaders urged people and officials to return to life as normal. We are now joined by Professor Bola Akinteriwa. He's the former DG, Nigeria Institute of International Affairs, and Imo Edit, who's a Senegal-based journalist. Good to have both of you. Uh, good to have you, Imo. I can see you are up already. Good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Right. We will connect to Professor Akinteriwa also in a bit. But before then, uh, let's begin with you. Uh, the last thing I, I read is, you know, the junta leaders asking the people to return to normal life. Let's begin from there. Do you think that is possible to immediately return to normal life? Well, looking at the fact that... Um the oyster of uh, IP, Ibekai, as it's popularly called here, was sent jubilation across Mali. Uh, I think they will listen to the military. I mean, they just wanted something, somebody who can remove EBK. It's, it's long coming. Mm. Uh, if you check the, the process of the protests uh, led by uh, Imam Mahmoud Diko, uh, it shows that the, the Malians really want to change. And they didn't. They didn't didn't care the change would come. And incidentally, uh, it, it came in in this manner, which it did. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they will listen to them for the moment. They have given their words that, look, they're not going to hold on to power for a long time. Mm -hmm. And within um, now and January, they will organize for you know, a transitional government. So I think they will listen to the military because they, it, it's something that they have wanted uh, just to help them exit uh, Ibeka, and, and that has happened. All right. So I, I strongly believe that they went into to the military. All right, let's take a bit on uh, the sanctions, Emo. Yes, these sanctions are expected, but it appears the country is indifferent. I'm wondering what's the mood like in Bamako since you are monitoring the situation over there? Well, you know, initially it was, it was tense, and um, after the arrest of Ibeka, and is the prime minister, um, life seems to return to, to normal. The, the excitement that the fact that he has left, you know, was still very much on. The, there were jubilations on the streets of uh, Bamako and, and Mali at large. Uh, I, I think that um, for now, they will just have to wait and see uh, what the military will come up with. Yes, they have set um, a time frame between now and January to hold an uh, election in, in uh, partnership with the uh, civil society organizations and with uh, the opposition group. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are very much um, ready to ensure that they hand over power to, you know, to hand over this particular regime to a new democracy. So uh, we're waiting to see that the mood is calm at the moment. Opposition have, have relaxed and possibly gone back to the uh, negotiation table to discuss and see how they can uh, they can come together. Don't forget that in Mali, they have a very strong position. And the fact that um, the opposition is being led by the a popular imam who had uh, a discussion with our own our former president, Goodluck Jennifer, who was sent as an envoy. And yet, uh, what they wanted, their final request was, look, Ibeka must leave, and he has left. So now it's time for them to return to the, to the round table with um, civil society organizations, with the political parties, you know, in the opposition and with the military to discuss how they can have a new government. Right. And talking about the opposition, uh, any possible link between the mutineers and the opposition, would you say? I, I wouldn't say there is a link, but what we know that uh, on the day of the, uh, on, on, on the, of the coup, we saw um, wide cheers and support from opposition. Um, they, they say it wasn't a coup. It was, uh, there's a term they actually use uh, in, in French. And it's like a, a jolly good fellow helping, you know, another friend. Mm -hmm. There's actually no, no link between the military and the, the opposition. But there is a strong 
connection between both of them. Now, the opposition, like I mentioned earlier, uh, supported what the military did, you know, two days ago, and now is to see what comes out of this. Uh, it's to see what are the plans moving forward. Aside the fact that the um, you know sub-regional blue has cut off all deals with with the country, and they have also ordered that all their borders you know, uh, with, with 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 Mauritania and the rest of them be be, be cut off. So uh, clearly. It's going to be a war between the military and the opposition, and I see the opposition being led by the popular imam. And if nothing has uh, happened between uh, them, uh, then maybe there may be something in the offing. But now, mm, there is no link. All right. Uh, um, we we're still trying to reconnect to Professor, but while we're doing while we're at it, let's continue the conversation with you. And my you know, next thought would be, or question would rather be, do you really think that the military saved the country from chaos, from what we saw uh, that happened? The case of Mali was like that of a time bomb waiting to explode. Um, we have seen that few of the guys who took part in the coup just returned from a six-month training either in Russia or in France. And so it's not something that, um, uh, that you know, that happened at an instant. It's something that had been carefully planned. And that's why they were able to get the support of, uh, you know, other uh, armed forces, the police, the Navy, Air Force, and the rest of them. So I think uh, it, it's a carefully planned thing. And we are expecting to see uh, this setting sets in a place for the likes of Watara, the likes of Afar Konde, who are also finding themselves you know, in, in this issue. Mm. Uh, the military came in because there were lots of, already we've seen more than 14 people being killed you know, in, the, in the past month of the protest. And um, the reason why we saw calm in Mali, you know, the, the past few weeks, because of the Eid, Eid uh, festivities. So, but after that, that you know, they, they called for, for more protests. And of course, more lives would have been lost so the military felt it was, you know, at this point, we needed to come in to avoid more bloodshed, and that was what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Imo, as you clearly uh, explained there, we've seen a lot of sit-tight uh, uh, leaders in Africa. And I'm wondering, is this mm -hmm. going to send some kind of strong message to say, when it is time, uh, if you have to resign, do so and do so graciously? De definitely. I mean, this is... This has been um, the, the most uh, discussed issue in the past two days, not just in, in, in the WADR, but also across media houses here in, in, in uh, Senegal, in Mali. It's a strong signal to other leaders who are sitting tight, who don't want to leave power. Um, another, another target, we are thinking what this may likely happen in Kodoba, mm. because we have seen Watara Going back on his words, yes, we understand that they had prepared uh, Modigon Kolebali to take over from him, but unfortunately, he died, and uh, we expected that he would have assigned or bring up another person to take the position of of Modigon Kolebali. But that didn't happen. But rather, he decided to run for another chair. And already, you know, it has started brewing some some crisis in 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 Cote d'Ivoire. We are worried, very worried, that this may egg, you know. Uh, egg explode to what we have in Mali. Mm -hmm. A strong signal to, to echo. In fact, as, as we speak right now, um, if you ask a typical French journalist, it will tell you who are those who make up ECOWAS. Is it not, uh, uh, you know, Watara? Is it not uh, Fakonde and the rest of them? Mm -hmm. So if you take out these uh, three people from mm -hmm. ECOWAS, ECOWAS will just be left with the likes of Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and, and, the, you know, and the very few of them. So these are strong powers. Cote d'Ivoire is a very strong uh, country. Just like Nigeria, they are the, uh, the world's largest export of cocoa. You know, so this may likely happen in Cote d'Ivoire if Ouattara doesn't learn from what is happening in Mali. Hmm. Strong points there. All right, we have Professor Akin Seriwa on the line. Good to have you, Professor. Good morning. Good morning to you. We apologize for the technical issues. The conversation is the same from where we left it yesterday. And yesterday, Prof, you said that this is not a coup d'etat, uh, maybe because it is bloodless. But do you agree that it was a forceful takeover? Um, it's very difficult to talk about a 
forceful changeover. The issue is, what is forceful changeover? Forceful changeover begins with the use of force. The word itself, forceful, is, is derived from that. Now, when the people of Mali requested President Ibrahim Bubaka Keita to resign, there is an element of force there in the sense that they are compelling an elected president. But it can be considered that the uh, minimum uh, force is used. Mm. This is what we call in international relations the principle of um, manu military. You use force without going to the extent of use of weapons, of military weapons. So in this case, to that extent, you cannot liken Manu military to the definition of forceful change of government as defined by the African Union. So what has happened? Keita refused to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. Keita refused. Now, the African Union came in through the ECOWAS. And when I say through the ECOWAS, I'm talking about the principle of uh, subsidiarity. The principle requires that a region of Africa can settle its problem. But if unable to first of all resolve it, they refer the matter to the African Union. So this intervention of the African Union in Mali is that they are emphasizing forceful change of government, that there shouldn't be any forceful something. The critical problem is that the people of uh, Mali are the ones asking for change. So there's conflict between supranational authority and the sovereign authority of the people of uh, Mali. Consequently, I don't agree that there has been any possible change of government. At best, we talk about popular insurrection, as the people of Mali have said, this is my position. Mm. Professor, but why do you think the opposition resisted ECOWAS recommendation for peaceful dialogue? Because there were efforts uh, to that that obviously failed. You need to reconcile the interests of the ECOWAS and the interests of the people of Mali. What is the problem in Mali? And what is the problem with which ECOWAS is concerned? They are different. Now, ECOWAS is emphasizing dialogue. But the people of uh, Mali, they are already fed up. They are no longer interested in dialogue. The issue of dialogue has been on for long. This problem started early 2020. Early 2020. Mm -hmm. The first problem in uh, Mali is the issue of uh, the as our um, people who want to be autonomous, that's a threat to national unity. Another problem, you have the terrorist organizations which want to infiltrate the whole West Africa. They are spreading an um, um, Islamic agenda. Another problem in uh, Mali, the social economic situation, is terrible. For the past two years, the schools are not open. So for educational purposes, it's a setback. Mm. So the people have been complaining. What did ECOWAS do by that time? ECOWAS was just uh, observing. So this is the issue. So the problems uh, are not the same from the perspective of uh, the Malians. Mm -hmm. and the ECOWAS uh, authority. This is the issue.
All right. I mean, before we were able to connect with you, we were having the conversation with uh, Imo Edit, who's also listening to our conversation. And we were talking about the strong opposition that is led uh, by Imam Diko. Now, the question for you again, Prof, is what do opposition stand to gain in case the military dissolves the current party system and possibly uh, the candidates as well? Hello? Yes, please. Did you hear me? Okay. okay, I can hear you now. Okay, so I, I was saying that before we were able to connect to you, we had a conversation with um, Imo Edet, who is a journalist uh, monitoring the situation in Mali, and he's also listening into this conversation. And we talked extensively around the opposition in Mali, which is led by the you know, very popular Imam Diko. Now, what do you think the opposition stand to gain in case the military dissolves the current party system and then possibly the candidates as well? What would they stand to gain? Well, there is everything, there is everything to gain. The first gain is that they wanted the um, theater to go. Uh, they used their pressure to get him out. But he didn't. Now it was when the military came in that he was compelled by 12 midnight to resign. Mm. And now since he said he didn't want a blood shell and he has resigned, that is the starting point of the game. The second point is that the military is not going to be in power, I can assure you. As I mentioned yesterday, the environmental conditions of uh, Mali do not allow for the military mm. to take over. It's not possible. Apart from the fact that uh, military dictatorship is no longer in vogue, it's not fashionable. They know this. But um, for the military that have low morale, that have been faced with different difficulties, I think they have just taken advantage mm. of um, the, the situation to force President Keita to leave. So I think that uh, even if the ECOWAS are taking some um, sanctionary measures against Mali, close border, remove the membership, it, it is good, it is normal. It's still to contain the spread of the problem. But the issue is that this is the beginning of uh, peacemaking. And if you put a stop, please allow me to make this point. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sovereignty of the people, the sovereignty of um, ECOWAS cannot overrule. It cannot override the sovereignty of the people of the Mali. So if the people of Mali, in their majority, say this is what they want, a regional organization cannot suppress the interests of the people. Mm. And that is the message. All right. Okay, let me now bring in uh, uh, Imo, who is still there. Imo, you're very familiar with the terrain. You're monitoring uh, what is happening there. You know very well what is yeah. going on there. I'm, I'm just wondering, how can Mali survive with the increasing economic sanctions being imposed on them now? Well, I think since this is a short-term measure, uh, there may not really be much impact. Uh, don't forget, Mali... Uh, is equally a rich country. We may think Mali is um, uh, a deserted country. No. Um, under that desert, there are lots of minerals. That's why you see um, they have lots of foreigners working there. Um, they will survive. Mali is equally a big, a big um, economy. And I'm sure that uh, the military also would have uh, people who will understand the economics of Mali and will be able to run their affairs in the short term. Mm. I don't see them having any issues with all the, the, the lockdowns. Uh, this, this can also be seen as a COVID-19 lockdown. I mean, if they were able to survive within the period when, you know, all countries had to close their borders, you know, to contain the spread, uh, this may just be a little bit longer. I mean, till January, when uh, we hear that uh, there may likely be a fresh elections. I, I don't see them having any issues uh, with the economy. Yes, 
the people may feel it in the interim uh, because one, some of those things from neighboring countries may not really be coming in, but they may just have to do with what they have, you know, for the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that once they have been able to uh, normalize the situation, uh, part of the borders may be opened, may be forced to open, despite whatever ECOWAS must have said uh, for countries not to have trades with them. Mm. All right. I think that's on the notes where we wrap it. I want to say thank you so very much, uh, Imo Edit, there for your contributions. And of course, Professor Akinteriwa, mm. thank you for joining us and making your own uh, contributions on the matter. Thank you right. for so, having me. Thank you. Right. And do keep safe, both of you.